I did not remotely anticipate how well loved these episodes are going to become, but Phobias as Demons just seems to be that series that keeps on giving. I mean, despite the fact that I haven't actually given you all one in a while, but we are finally back for round six. I've continued to get tons of great suggestions for people for other famous fears that I could turn into demons, and from all of your suggestions, I think I've pulled a cool set of four to use for today. So let's get into it, shall we? Let's go. Hit like, if you want. Subscribe, if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. A fear of sharks would not strike most as a wholly unreasonable concern, despite the facts around it. The number of reported, unprovoked shark attacks around the world rarely dips into triple digits annually, and the deaths often stay below 10. But even still, it is not difficult to understand why someone would fear a cascade of razor teeth swimming up from the depths of the sea to tear into their flesh. Some people are so afraid of these creatures that their fright becomes a near crippling phobia. The very thought of entering a body of water, even one that realistically could not contain a shark, becomes overwhelmingly anxiety inducing, so they'll simply avoid these scenarios altogether. But that action, unfortunately, cannot keep them completely safe from the demon, Galeoja. As all demons of fear do, this demon preys on those with a specific fear. In this case, that of sharks. Galeoja has many traits similar to that of various breeds of sharks, but with an added ability that makes it more than capable of seeking out those who adamantly avoid the seas. Galeoja can swim not only through water, but through the air. In this way, it is much like the demon Hydrothala, but this beast has no need to lure its victims back to the seas. It can torment its prey more easily in a crowd. The demon can also only be seen by someone with a significant fear of sharks, so while on the hunt for its next prey, the demon will simply swim through a city sky, past office windows and over streets, until it smells the sweet swell of fear it seeks. When an unfortunate victim spots the creature, inevitably their heart will race, and in the seconds they spend trying to convince themselves that this is some horrendous dream, their eyes will start to cloud. Everything around them will become darker and hazier, as if they're deep underwater. If they try to call out for help to those around them, all that will emerge from their mouths is a gasp and a plume of bubbles, visible only to themselves. The people around the being will always think this person has gone mad, seeing none of the horrors the poor soul is witnessing. The demon will continue to swim in circles above the person as they try to cry out for help more and more. In some cases, the victim will stumble into traffic and be hit by a car or even fall off a building in confusion. But when they don't, paramedics or police are often called to them by those around. Eventually, as they try to thrash and get away from those thinking they're helping, the being will be strapped down to a hospital bed, forced then to watch as Galeoja continues to swim in and out of their view. This can continue for days on end, until the demon is satisfied with how marinated in fear its victim is. Then, it will devour them, leaving no trace, so they seem to have simply disappeared. Now with this lore, as I was writing it, I realized that I actually had done a demon before that was a water demon that could come up out of the water, and I wanted to make this one different from my other ones, but I also wanted it to have that trait, because I wanted it to be able to seek out people with a fear of sharks without them having to come into the water already facing their fears. But to make sure I still made this different from my fear of water, which I'd done before, Hydrothala, as I mentioned, I decided to have this demon actually attack people who are in crowds, which I don't think I've done, if, I ha if I've used it at all, it's been very little. A lot of the time, my demons try to get someone isolated to start tormenting them. With this one, I was like, let's lean into that idea of when you're in a dream and you're trying to run away from something and you feel like you're moving through sludge, or when you try to call out and all that comes out of your mouth is like a gasp of air instead of actually calling to anyone. I thought that would be a fun element to work with. Fun being a weird word to use, but you get what I mean. Even if it's not a super shark specific 
specific element to the fear, I thought it would really up the fear level for this demon. In terms of the design, I looked at a whole bunch of different shark designs, sea monster kind of designs in general, some deep sea fish sort of looks, but mostly I was referencing goblin sharks, because goblin sharks are really freaky looking sharks, and they've got mouths that can kind of like pop out of their mouth, which is how I got the idea to have two different sets of mouths in this one, and I think that ends up looking really cool. I knew as I was finishing this one that it was going to be the thumbnail demon. Anyway, hope you all like it, and we got more cool stuff to come. It has been said that laughter is poison to fear. And while there is some interesting truth to that, for someone with galatophobia, it is very much not the case. Nobody enjoys being laughed at, but those with a specific fear of such an occurrence can come to find the very sound of even their own laughter to send waves of anxiety coursing through their body and mind. A young high schooler named Hazim had developed this very fear, brought on soon after his family had moved to America from Pakistan. His English was still developing in his first days at his new school, and paired with his thick accent, some cruel students mocked how he spoke, to a point where he didn't want to say anything at all. Of course, in school there are many situations in which speaking is unavoidable, so the mocking continued to come. To make things worse, he developed a stutter, making it that much harder even as his English improved. He'd been laughed at so many times that the faintest snicker could practically start his eyes watering in sadness and fear. As his fear grew and grew, unbeknownst to Hazim, he was luring to himself the demon, Jestegofa. This demon followed Hazim as he walked home one night, while he was listening to something on his phone a teacher had recommended. Over the sound of his headphones, Hazim started to hear the very noise that made him tremble. He tried turning up his sound to drown it out, but the laughing got louder and louder. Finally, he tore off his headphones and looked around. There seemed to be two voices. One laugh was a deep and bellowing guffaw, and the other was a high-pitched wail, like someone laughing themselves to death. After looking around in horror and seeing nothing, he finally spotted, down the road, a stumbling, seven-foot-tall figure hobbling towards him, laughing hysterically through two mouths, one on its massive wrinkled head and one replacing its stomach. He tried to turn and run the other way, but when he spun around, the creature was there behind him, still approaching on his other side. He turned again, and there it was once more. His whole body shook as he was forced to just wait in place for the creature to get closer and closer, then stop a foot in front of his face. Its laughter ceased, and it just stared at him. He whipped around, and there it was again, still staring and waiting. He tried to ask it what it wanted, but all that came out was a stammer. The second the creature heard this, it started cackling again and pointing at him, then making a mocking, stuttering sound itself, only to laugh more and more. Hazim tried speaking again, and once more eruptions of deafening laughter at his stammer. A week prior, this event may have been enough to make Hazim keel over in emotional agony. But in that moment, after staring at these disgusting, cackling faces for what seemed like hours, Hazim actually started to laugh right back. The more he analyzed this thing before him, the harder he laughed. His own laughing soon stopped that of the demon, who instead started looking confused. What the demon hadn't realized was that it had gotten to Hazim a little too late. A teacher of Hazim's who was very sympathetic of his problem recommended to the boy that he listen to a speech by the speaker Steve Harvey, who himself had had a bad stammer as a child and was even ridiculed by his teacher in front of his whole class after claiming he wanted to be on TV when he grew up. Harvey's own teacher told him in front of all his peers that his dream was ridiculous and got him in trouble for even suggesting it as a possibility. Years later, however, Harvey would become an incredible comedian and public speaker with no sign of his stammer remaining, and he'd even become one of the most televised personalities in the history of television. And since becoming so wealthy and successful, he now every year sends the teacher who shamed him a brand new TV to make sure she can see him on television every night. 
Hazim had been listening to the audio of Harvey telling this story over and over again for the last week to build his own confidence in his future, and now, despite the terror and confusion of this monster before him, Hazim understood that it was just trying to mock him and make him feel small, and that it couldn't control how he felt about himself if he didn't let it. Through his own laughs and stammering words, Hazim told the creature, I'm not going to have a stutter forever, but I bet you're always going to be this ugly. The creature's confusion turned to anger. Hazim turned away from it once again, but this time, it did not appear in his path. A few steps later, he briefly glanced back to see that the demon was now gone. He never tried telling anybody what he faced that day, and now he isn't even entirely sure if he believes it himself. But what could have been a life-ending occurrence ended up giving Hazim thicker skin, as no laughter he ever heard thereafter sounded nearly as cruel as what had come from that demon. I was really excited to work in Steve Harvey's personal story into that. I'd been thinking about writing a story about a character overcoming a stammer, or dealing with being mocked around it because I've heard Steve Harvey tell that story so many times, and I felt like a fear of being laughed at was a perfect setting for that story. But I also knew in telling that it had to be one of my demon stories that has a positive ending and some kind of inspiring message built into it, like encouraging someone with a stutter to go listen to successful speakers that have overcome that. As a reminder that your present reality is not necessarily going to be your future reality. In terms of the design, I feel like it's fairly self-explanatory. I needed a demon that looked like it could be cackling at someone. I had it crying, laughing on one of the faces. And I took some inspiration from Attack on Titan, as I have done a few times for this series. Quick interruption here to say that I have finally made a new ink bundle. This one's got 90 different inks in it for $9 American. Usual sort of thing, you can download them and color them on a drawing software or print them off and color them traditionally. But if you want a better deal in my opinion, you can get all those inks plus every other ink bundle I've ever made, over 500 inks, and the inks from every episode going forward by signing up for the Popcraft Studios Patreon for only $5 a month. Plus you get high resolution art a day before a video is released and a huge backlog of high resolution art, as well as access to a bonus design Design Notes podcast that I'm doing on there. But if you just want the ink bundle, I'll link it and the Patreon in the description. Anyway, back into more demons. Let's go! For many young children, dolls can provide a great sense of joy. They are often beloved toys that help inspire a caring nature or a greater sense of imagination, as children make believe these toys are real beings. Though only in very, very rare occasions does this belief turn out to actually be true. There is a demon by the name of Pediobel, who appears like a blend of a porcelain and marionette doll. The last victim I recall hearing a tale of facing this demon was that of a single mother named Tamika, who had a daughter, Grace, of five years old that desperately wanted a doll of her own. But her mother couldn't bear to have one in the home, as she was terrified of the little things. She'd seen the movie Chucky at a very young age, and never really gotten over it. She tried giving her daughter any other kind of toy in place of a doll, but nothing brought the girl the joy of getting a doll like the one she dreamed of. Unfortunately for Tamika, Pediobel has its own ways of getting into the homes of those it hungers for. The demon conceals itself as a normal plaything and puts itself in the path of a loved one of the person it seeks, often sitting on a street corner with a free-to-a-good-home sign next to it. Tamika's brother Jackson fell prey to this trap and took the doll to give to his niece on her birthday. Tamika was horrified seeing the gift, but Grace was ecstatic, loving the present, despite Tamika thinking the thing looked like a three-foot-tall pale mutant. But seeing the incredible joy on her daughter's face, paired with the convincing from Jackson that this would be a good way to get over her fear, Tamika grudgingly allowed her daughter to keep it. Over the first week of the doll being in her home, Tamika kept finding it in strange places, though just normal enough that her daughter could have put it there. This is how Pediobel starts building the fear in its victims, slowly. It will then appear in the bedroom of its prey at night, often leading to the child of the victim getting in some kind of trouble. But Tamika, unknown to Pediobel, was already very open to the supernatural as a real possibility and had grown quite certain that something otherworldly was up with this doll. 
Tamika awoke in the middle of the night to see the doll sat at the foot of her bed. But instead of screaming or jumping in terror, however, Tamika yelled out, Oh, f no. She grabbed the lamp off the side of her bed and smashed it against the doll's head, cracking its porcelain face open. The doll's head spun all the way around and faced Tamika again, revealing purple ooze pouring from its cracks. Goopy, slimy arms suddenly sprung out from its back and slammed to the ground, raising it into the air, as it said, Don't hurt me, Tamika. I love you. But before it could finish, Tamika had pulled a shotgun from under her bed and started unloading buckshot shells into the thing. Tamika heard Grace wake up and yell and run towards the closed door of her bedroom, asking what was wrong. But Tamika told her, Don't come in, sweetie. Uh, mommy's killing a rat. She didn't want her daughter seeing this thing and getting the same fear Tamika had lived with for so long. She kept unloading shells, but when she was out of ammo, she spun the gun around and smacked the button to the doll's head. The head came clean off and goop splattered across the room. The head rolled to the floor and just stared up at Tamika, saying, Don't be afraid, Tamika. She stomped over to it and said, I'm afraid of dolls, not freaky goo monsters, you weird little bitch. She stomped her heel into its head and shattered it to pieces. All its parts suddenly dissolved away, leaving no trace of the demon. Tamika panted furiously for a moment. Then the door creaked open. But it was just Grace. Mommy, are you okay? D did you get the rat? Yeah, sweetie. I, I got it. It's okay. Uh, okay. Uh, have you seen my dolly? It went to live on a farm. Go back to bed. <laughs> so obviously on the story, I have no notes. That's one of my new favorite stories on the channel. Apologies for the profanity, but, you know, hopefully bleeping it means nobody will be upset about that. In terms of the design, I really loved how this one turned out. As I started drawing it, I'd actually forgotten about marionette dolls as a possibility to add into this, but that came to mind as on my other monitor, I opened up some images of both Annabelle from the Conjuring series and uh, Gabby Gabby from Toy Story 4. But when I opened up images of that, I also saw the images of the creepy marionette dolls from Toy Story 4. I was like, ooh, yeah, I could work a little bit of that in. And so I have the, the marionette handle thing kind of floating up behind the demon, like some of the strings cracking off of it. And then in terms of the goopy arms, honestly, there's not a really good doll-specific reason to work that in. I just... You know, obviously, as I've said many times, I really like drawing goopy elements, and I had this image in my mind of goop kind of spilling out of the cracks in a porcelain doll, so then I kind of just expanded from there, and overall, I love how this one turned out. And again, <laughs> I, I do really love the story for this one. That's kind of the sort of goofy one of the episode. Anyway, I hope you all liked it as well. Here's the finished drawing. It's believed by some spiritualists that the state we are all seeking to return back to is one of pure love. Love brings out the best in all of us, and for most, we cannot be in fear when we are feeling true love. But, like so many good things in this world, there are those who have a deep-rooted fear of it. Brett had spent his life being a notorious people-pleaser, and never felt worse than when he was disappointing those around him in some way. He tried to keep everyone happy at all times, even when that meant exhausting himself to do so. Because of this, the most traumatic thing he'd ever experienced was when he broke up with his high school girlfriend. He'd stopped having feelings for her months prior, and was planning to go to a university far from her, so eventually, he worked up the nerve to tell her, as nicely as he could, that they were through. And she was mortified. She threatened to take her own life, told him he was a monster, and that he'd been leading her on and she never wanted to see him again. For months after, he had nightmares about the event, and would awake in a panic, thinking himself to be a truly awful person for having hurt her so badly. His parents tried to assure him that he'd done the right thing, and to just forget about the whole ordeal. But their disregard for his true anguish only hurt him more. He went off to university and thankfully got away from most things that reminded him of the relationship, but that part of his past still haunted him. Any time he found himself getting flirtatious with another woman, he'd find a way to cut the conversation short and leave, horrified that he may eventually fall in love, then eventually back out of it, and have to hurt someone as badly as he had before. 
But this was when a woman came into his life who persisted through his attempts to sabotage their conversations. She didn't seem willing to let him get away. She said her name was Valerie, and she was the closest thing to a soulmate Brett could imagine. They had all the same interests, she complimented him on things he was insecure about, and seemed head over heels for him while still having her own goal to become a sports newscaster, relieving some pressure from the relationship. It gave him a sense of ease knowing that she had something else she cared deeply for besides a potential romance. Brett was still terrified, but eventually could not resist her advances and started dating Valerie. The first month they were together, they took things slow, as Brett wanted, but his defenses were dropping as he started to finally feel truly safe with her, as if she could be the love of his life. Though he still had nightmares of suddenly losing his love for her and feeling the need to end things and disappointing her. Little did he know, Valerie was feeding on this fear. Into their second month together, Valerie started slowly showing a second side to herself. She got clingy, stating that she loved Brett more than anything in the world. Her past desire to be a sportscaster vanished, and she started calling him and texting him constantly when they were apart, saying that she couldn't imagine life without him, that he was all she wanted. She also started claiming disinterest in the things that they'd mutually enjoyed just months earlier, and Brett was finding he enjoyed their time together less and less, and that spiked his anxiety more and more. By the start of their third month, Brett was waking up every morning dreading his life, not wanting to spend his time with Valerie, but being mortified of how much he'd hurt her if he left. He wanted to just try carrying on, finding the good moments where he could, despite his unhappiness but he knew that wasn't right. As he grew more and more miserable, he realized he had to do something. So he tried something that he was still mortified to do. He told her he was unhappy. He sat down with Valerie and said that he was upset that they weren't doing the same activities together they had earlier in the relationship, and tried to tell her that they should try and find more mutual interests again. He was sharing his concerns, but also trying to find solutions. Still, his heart thudded like it would tear through his shirt, and it only got worse when Valerie responded. She freaked out, and her response was all over the place. She said that he was the one who'd changed, not her, that he should love her enough to do the things that she wanted to do. She jumped from that to saying that she needed him to be her rock, that she needed him like she needed to breathe, but also that she shouldn't have to change for him. She suddenly started to weep, begging that he not leave her. Brett's body shook so hard he thought he must be quaking the room. That was when he saw the blood. Valerie's tears turned red and blood started spilling from her stomach. She cried out that he was killing her, that she was dying and it was all his fault. He leapt up and scrambled around to find something to stop the bleeding, darting across the room to grab a blanket, but when he lifted it from the couch, it suddenly flung up onto his face, covering his eyes for a brief moment. When he brought it down, he was no longer in Valerie's apartment, but in a near empty void. The only thing before him, lying on the floor in a pool of blood, was his high school girlfriend, bawling and asking, Why, Brett? Why did you do this to me? Suddenly, more figures appeared. Some were friends Brett had made, some were women he didn't recognize, he even saw his parents. All were crying, begging him for an explanation of why he'd hurt them so. His legs failed him and Brett crumbled to the floor. He tried to crawl away, but then his hand sloshed into a puddle of blood. He whipped around and looked up at Valerie, in her true form, as the demon Philevelos. She told him that these people were all those he'd love and would inevitably hurt. That he'd spend his whole life hurting everyone he loved, but that she could end his suffering. He didn't understand what was happening, but her words still cut through. Though not in the way she intended. He looked around, eyes darting back to his high school girlfriend, and thought about all the times that she had hurt him. His mind then fell on his parents. They'd hurt him too at times, but it didn't change the fact that he loved them. In the midst of this chaos, a realization finally dawned on him. 
hurting people and being hurt by people is an inevitable part of life. And just because he had hurt people and likely would again, it didn't make him worthy of the suffering he'd inflicted on himself. Philavelos could feel the fear slipping away, and the cacophony of voices around started to cry out louder and louder. He covered his ears, but looked up at her and said, Valerie, I'm sorry that this hurts, but I'm leaving and I hope you find happiness somewhere else. The screams all suddenly ceased, and in a flash, they were back in Valerie's apartment. Apparently, he did just then walk away. There are various theories as to what happened. Some in the Predator Coalition of Demon Hunters think he did just overcome his fear, enough to leave, but others have suggested that Philevelos was genuinely moved by his good wish to her, despite her having tormented him. It will be hard to ever learn the truth of this, but what is known is that Brett, to this day, is more open to finding love, and does so with the knowledge that whoever he ends up with may hurt him and he may hurt them, but that the love they'd feel between the painful moments was well worth any sadness that would come. Now I know it had been a long time since I did a Phobias as Demons episode, but it's also been a long time since I did a Ben 10 episode, which I do plan to get back to, but if you want something to hold you over, I recommend checking out this video by Knight of Arcane. It's got some really cool Ben 10 fusions in it, and if you like the format of this channel, you might like that as well. And that could be a big channel someday, it might be kind of fun to be in the first thousand subscribers. Go give it a look if you're interested, I'll link it in the card. Anyway, it was super fun going back to the Demon series. I really should do more of these, whether more Phobias as Demons, Dinosaur Demons, Disney Princess Demons. Just let me know what you want out of the Demon series next. And if you're new here, you might want to check out the compilation episode of the first five Phobias as Demons episodes. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note, and the thought I want to leave people with today is actually based on an experience I had this week, where I found myself really upset with something that had happened, and I was kind of just stewing in the anger for like 15 or 20 minutes, and eventually I went, okay, this is not a productive use of my time and energy, but I'm also feeling kind of stuck in it, so what can I do to get out of it? And that was when I decided to do the shout out for Night of Arcane. I'd seen that video earlier in the day, I'd commented on it, but then thinking about the fact of doing something nice for someone and giving a smaller channel a shout out was enough to put me in a much more positive state and ignore the anger that I'd been having before. So if you find yourself stuck in some kind of negativity, try and think of something that day or that week that you could do nice for someone. It's hard to stay angry when you're prepping to make someone else feel good. I hope that's inspiring to someone out there. Thank you so much for watching everybody. I love you all and I'll see you all in the next episode, finally continuing the Pokemon Superhero series with an episode on villains. I'll see you there. Goodbye.